you're welcome on board. Thanks, I we are glad to have you today. Um, let me share. Can you guys see this? Yes. Right, so I'm not gonna see the chat while I speak. So if you, if somebody can, you know, let me know if there are hands up or, or questions. So maybe I'll, feel free to interrupt me. I'll moderate um, them. Thanks. Um, all right, so, um, well, thanks for the uh, for the kind invitation to um, to talk to you. Um, I'm gonna present some of the, you know, a broad overview to my to my research field and how I've been using the bears to, to, to tackle this. Um, so I'm a lecturer at the Institute for Gravitational Wave Astronomy. And indeed my uh, you know, research is all about black holes and, and gravitational waves. And I'll try to um, guide you a little bit to the things I do and well, ultimately the things I like. All right. All right, so this is just one you know, quick overview about me. I grew up in uh, Northern Italy next to Milan, uh, where I went for you know, my undergrads or so. I was then a PhD student here in the UK in Cambridge. I flew all across the world for um, uh, a NASA fellowship uh, at the California Institute of Technology in uh, near Los Angeles. And now I'm back to the UK in Birmingham, where my research is supported by the European Research Council. All right, so um, I'd like to start from here, um, from the following. So think about what we know about the universe. We actually know a ton of stuff, you know, going from planets where we live to stars that we see around in the, in the, in the night sky. Uh, these stars, you know, billions of stars are contained in a single galaxy. There are billions, you know, hundreds of billions of galaxies in the, in the entire universe. Um, so we know. We've been learning to know the universe from the small scales to we live all the way to the, you know, the scales of the entire universe themselves. Um, right. But how do we know all these things? So what do we actually see? If you think about it, virtually all the information that we have about the universe come to us through light. So we see what, you know, the universe wants us to show us. Um, by its light emission, so uh, you know electromagnetic emission, um, right? But light is not what keeps the universe together. You know, we we know uh, at least from um, yeah, we all know universe is kept together by by gravity, which is another another force. So the very fabric that keeps the universe together is not the way that we use to know about the universe and understand what what, what is going on and learn about it. So the point of you know, attempting to do gravitational wave astronomy is really the following. Can we use gravity itself instead of light to know and, you know, constrain things about the astrophysical world? So uh, just a brief overview, right? Electromagnetic radiation, on the one hand, I mean, it's composed by, it's emitted by charged particles. So you need charges, mainly electrons and protons that, you know, can produce electromagnetic radiation. And crucially, it's strongly coupled to, well, to everything, including our own eyes. That means that it's very easy to, to detect. I mean, we see light with, with, with our eyes, and then with cameras, telescope, or so, and distorted. So if you want to peer, say you want to see the, the, the other edge of the Milky Way, our own galaxy, it's virtually impossible with light because there's all the you know, galactic dust that's completely obscures what's going on behind it. Um, so similarly, you know, in physics, we know that charge is conserved, meaning that monopole radiation, so that there are two kinds of charges, like plus and minus, meaning that monopole radiation to work, meaning, you know, two charges, plus and minus, that's what I really mean here. Um, so on the other hand, gravitational radiation, and by here, I mean gravitational waves. So perturbation in the space-time generated by large moving masses. Um, it's not sensitive to the charge, like, um, you know, like light, but rather to the, to the mass itself. So it's really the mass that moves around and disturbs the space-time, eventually, you know, generating signal that we can hopefully detect. Um, it's very, it couples very, very weakly with matter or with anything else. 
So this means that, as I'll show in a minute, it's extremely hard to detect. Um, but at the same time, it travels basically unaffected. So once you detect it, then you have a unique probe of you know, the very energetic phenomena that affect the universe without, basically without interruption. Um, again, on the physics side, conservation here, we have conservation of mass and momentum, which implies that also the dipole is forbidden, meaning that um, qu really quadrupole radiation is, is what you want. So something, so a source that, that has, you know, that doesn't have a single axis. Let's do some more magnitude calculation. So these gravitational waves are naturally predicted in Einstein's theory of general relativity, which predicts up here, uh, these are the famous Einstein's equations for, um, you know, for if somebody has saw these things already. Um, so the right-hand side, the left-hand side says, so this term G involves the curvature of the space-time and T is the energy. So this equation here, which is a, a masterpiece in, in modern physics, Or is saying that um, gravity curves the spacetime on the, on the one end, and curvature causes um, matter to move on the other hand. Um, so crucially, the key term here is the so-called mass quadruple. The, it's the leading term that enters this equation, which is this guy Q, which is so an integral. So basically, the overall um, it's the quadrupole mass moment. So rho is the mass density say, you know, grams over centimeter cubes or, or so. And then you integrate it twice over the, the space. So this X, J, K are really the, uh, you know, the, the Cartesian coordinate of your, of your space. Um, so this tells you that it's only, you really need a system of masses to, to generate quadru um, gravitational waves, um, which is, you know, highlighted in this, you know, little animation that I have here in the, in the bottom left. So this is the effect of a gravitational wave hitting vertically through the plane um, of the board of the screen onto a ring of masses. So you have a ring of masses over there. You vertically, and what's happening? So the, the net effect on the on the ring of masses is that it oscillates along these two directions, so horizontal and vertical direction, which is the characteristic quadrupolar pattern. Um, so what kind of sources now can generate gravitational waves? Well, everything, literally. So any mass that is moving, so, you know, myself moving two hands like this, hope you can see my fancy. Um, but really we need big things. So, and that's, let's try to figure it out with an order of mind to calculation. So the gravitational wave strain age, um, it's the quadrupole mass moment. So it's, it scales as the mass of the system, m, the velocity square over the distance. So, and the gravitational wave strain A, it's really the displacement that you cause in a, um, in a set of masses. In other terms, if you want, how much these dots are moving in the bottom left. So another way to look at the same thing is if you have the size L, in order to detect the strain of magnitude h, you want to measure the, um, you want to know the size of your detector with the precision delta L, which is h times L, roughly. Right, okay, now let's try to work out the order of magnitude. Okay, so here in this example, I pick two cars, 10 to the 3 kilos or so. They're going very fast, 1,000 kilometers per hour on a very short track. I'm, I'm trying to maximize things, oh, one kilometer. Let's put my gravitational wave detector the closest I can. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, the closest I can, which is one wavelength away. It's a small number. So this is hopeless to detect and observe even in, you know, the wildest sci-fi movie that you can see. Um, all right, what we need, well, let's go, let's go, to, let's go to the, you know, the juice of the, of the topic here. What about binary black holes? So black holes are objects that are well known to exist in, in astrophysics, which are so compact 
that not even light can, can escape. And precisely because they are so compact, they can go very fast. Um, so a typical black hole will have a mass of the order, you know, 10 times the mass of our sun, give or take. That's about 10 to the 31 kilos. Uh, as I was saying, they, they can go very fast at the um, latest stage of their lives, about 10% of the speed of light. And let's put them, you know, outside of our galaxy. So 10 megaparsec away, 100 megaparsec away, I did. Okay. Um, if you plug the number in, what you get is 10 to the minus 21 for the typical strain, which is still an incredibly, incredibly small number. So on a size of one kilometer, that's small than the, smaller than the size of a single proton. Um, but that's the kind of achievement that, you know, um, that's a kind of experiment and setup that, that we do these days, measuring distances down to the precision of 10 to the minus 21. Um, right, so what kind of signal we're really looking into? Um, so in this plot, I have what, you know, the typical gravitational wave signal of, of a black hole binary looks like. So in this time goes, you know, on the x-axis from small to large. And this is the strain that the quantity A, 10 to minus 21 or so. In this first phase, the two black holes are in spiraling. So they're orbiting about each other. And what you see this cycle here are really the orbits of the two black holes. As you see, the frequencies of these orbits is, is decreasing. So the period, sorry, the frequency is increasing, the period is decreasing. Uh, and that's because gravitational waves are dissipating energy and angular momentum to settle down on a smaller, on a slightly smaller orbit. Eventually, the two black holes, so this can go on indefinitely, like you cannot shed energy away. At some point, the two black holes will eventually collide and you know, merge into, into one another, which correspond to this you know, big cycles here, these big bursts of gravitational waves. And then you're left with a single black hole that has to ring down, we say. So it's basically like, um, like hitting a bell with a hammer or so. The bell has to, you know, uh, it rings and, and then settles down to, to, to a stationary solution or, or so. Um, so this typical morphology made of in spiral merger ring down is a key prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity that predicts all these things beginning to end, which is what we are actually trying to match and verify with, with, with experiment. All right, um, you should have stopped me here um, because, yeah, sure, this is all cool and, and, and things, but we really need a precision of 10 to the minus 21, right? And if you were, uh, you know, young on this, you would inevitably say that you've done something wrong or, or so. Uh, so how can we even hope to measure distances down to this, um, down to this incredibly small precision? Um, well, this goes, you know, back, you know, people started to attempt the gravitational wave detection problem back in the 60s. The current techniques involves lasers and in particular laser interferometers. So the setup is that uh, of a so-called Michelson interferometer. So the idea is that you have a light source that emits, you know, laser very stable, very precise, very much controlled or so. Um, uh, the middle component is a so-called beam splitter. Basically it divides, so some of the laser goes through and some other, it's a semi-reflective uh, surface, so some other goes up. Then you have these two uh, arms of the interferometers that, you know, at the end of which there are mirrors. So like this mirror here, this mirror here, that reflects the light back back onto the, onto the beam splitter, and then eventually onto the detector. So now, if the uh, length of the two vertical, the two laser beams, meaning that we are, sorry, constructively, meaning that you see light down in the detector. If instead you change the length of the mirror a tiny, tiny bit, um, they would translate into a destructive interference and therefore you don't see light anymore. So through this device, you are sensitive to differences in the size of your detector of the order of the wavelength of the laser, right? Which is, well, tiny. That's, that's the point. And then there are several experimental adjustments that will go down below, below that limit. So crucially, these arms need to be huge. Uh, and these are the, you know, LIGO and Virgo setups. So the current experiments are made of these giant interferometers, each, each of which is four kilometers long. Um, 
it's a detect is a network of three detectors. Two of them are in the are in the U.S. in the state of Louisiana and and Washington near Seattle, and the the third one is is here in Europe in in central Italy. And so these three detectors, um, four kilometers long, or they continuously monitor the sky, looking for gravitational waves. And the key point of having three instruments is, of course, that because it's so easy to create a disturbance of 10 to the minus 21, um, you want the same, the exact same disturbance to have no detectors all across the world, make sure that this thing is some local, you know, interference, but really a gravitational wave signal coming from the sky. Um, right, so the um, construction of the light detector started in the early 2000, and uh, it saw the first flight in about 2010 with the first engineering run. Um, in 2015, they made a big up upgrade, um, and that came the first detection, that's 150914. Um, that's the signal that was observed, and as you see in the top right panel here, these are, at the time, only the two LIGOS detectors in the US were, were operational. As you see, there are, you know, in this top uh, right panel here, there's noise of the two detectors, which is largely uncorrelated, and then magically lines up for these, you know, three, four, five cycles or so, um, which is actually, you know, a, a, a gravitational wave event. And these are the typical, down at the bottom, these are the typical frequency time track, which matches spot on the predictions of Einstein's general relativity. So this discovery is, um, well, I would say one of the you know crucial discoveries in modern physics, or maybe in physics of all time, um, which for the first time saw the direct effect of of gravity. So the direct messenger of gravity, namely uh, gravitational waves. And so from that point, the so once the detector now are are working and, and taking data. Um, the, the, there was a deluge of new discoveries. And let me just mention uh, another one here. So in 2017, uh, this other event was, was observed, which instead of being the merger of two black holes, is the merger of two neutron stars, which are objects made, it's basically a giant nucleus, made entirely of neutrons, um, which is almost as compact as a black hole, not really, um, but almost. And so that can produce, you know, enough gravitational waves to be, um, to be observed. And what happened in 2017 is that, um, well, okay, LIGO and Virgo made the detection and say, uh, look at the green area here, um, said, oh, we saw something, it's coming from this region in, in the sky. And then almost immediately, other telescopes, in this case, observing light, not, not gravitational waves, and here the blue regions here are gamma rays uh, monitors, uh, they, mon they saw an event coming from the same region in the sky at the same time. Um, and then in about 10 hours, uh, now at that point, you know, the community went crazy. In about, you know, 10 hours or so, all telescopes in the world were pointing at their region in the sky to see what was going on. And eventually even optical telescopes, not just gamma rays, and these are the pictures that I have um, on, the, on the right, saw something. So this picture below was taken, it's an archival picture taken 20 days before the event. And this is just after 10 hours, 10 hours following the event, there's this new dot uh, here, which is really the aftermath of a neutron star, so two giant nuclei of, you know, radius up and producing all, um, you know, light and, and heavy elements or so, which, you know, produce light as well. So this is the first, and only so far, multi-messenger event, meaning that the same event in the universe was observed using two key messengers of physics, namely gravity and, and light. So the gravitational wave discovery was a big, as I was saying, one of the main, you know, the biggest thing that happened in, in modern physics, in, in my opinion, and was awarded the 2017 uh, Nobel Prize for the decisive contribution to the light detectors and the observation of gravitational waves to this um, uh, you know, the founders basically of the LIGO detector, uh, Ray Weiss at MIT and Barry Barish and Kip Thorne at Caltech. And all right, before I move into, um, yeah, so, you know, but more, more other things, let me, uh, let me have a light, a light slide here. So when the Nobel Prize uh, announcement came, I was working at Caltech uh, at the time. And so we got to know it 
uh, in the morning in California. I mean, it was awarded in, 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 in Europe. So by the time you, I mean, over there with time zones or so in California, it was early morning. So this is, you know, I was just walking to work. So, and I bumped into the um, Nobel Prize, um, the Nobel Prize party and this guy below, it's me. And actually this thing was so big that my hometown's newspaper back in Italy put together a picture with this error. I mean, this is really literally taken from the newspaper with this error or arrow of, oh, we have one of our citizens in, in the Nobel Prize or this kind of thing. All right, so um, let me take a, um, a physics, um, you know, take on, uh, on this problem. So um, let's step back a little bit and ask, um, yes, we talked about black hole mergers or so, but does it really make sense? In other terms, can black holes really make it? Do we understand why and so black holes can merge and produce gravitational waves? So this equation here at the top is another masterpiece of general relativity, which is saying how the distance between the two black holes A evolves in time T as a function of things like the constant, so the gravitational constant, the speed of light, the mass of the object, and Q is the mass ratio, so the ratio between the two, the two black holes. So crucially, there's this term here, which goes as the separation to the third power. So now, very easily, one can do the typical time scale on which the in spiral, so on which black hole and dissipate energy is given by HDA. That's the way to make a time out of this, out of this expression, which scales as the separation to the fourth, right? Then next thing, one can ask, okay, but what's the typical separation such that the black holes will merge in less than the age of the universe? In other terms, I'm scaling this equation with 10 to the 10 years, which is the entire lifetime of the universe, right? And what you find is that this number is about 10 times the radius of the sun. So let me explain better. If a binary, if a binary black hole is at a separation which is larger than about 10 times the radius of the sun, it will never merge. It will take more than the entire lifetime of the universe to dissipate enough energy through gravitational waves to generate a LIGO event, right? So we need to start from smaller separation. But this is very, very puzzling. It's, it's a complicated problem. And that's because 10 solar radii are, are nothing in, in, in astrophysical terms, like all binary stars, are at you know, hundreds, thousands of times this, this distance here. So if you start from binary stars, they will eventually form a core, but their separation is way, way too large to produce a LIGO event. So we need something else. So in other terms, relativity alone cannot explain what we are observing with LIGO. We need some astrophysics. And this is really you know, doing gravitation wave astronomy. So we need to, we need to put in knowledge of the astrophysical world and how things you know, evolve and behave to uh, even to explain space time and, and black hole things, right? So how do we, um, I mean, we, this is really part of a, of a huge field of science now. Um, one of the you know, typical debates that we are facing in, in my research field is the following. You can imagine two stars um, asking each other, um, have we been together for like, a, no, no, I don't know, an old couple or so. Have we been together for, for so long? And so what I want to say is that there are mainly two classes of models that we think can produce LIGO events. So on the left, um, you've got two stars here at the top. One of the stars collapses, forms a black hole. And from a stellar evolutionary standpoint, it's well understood how star collapses and form black holes. Um, the phase, which is which when you have a black hole orbiting a star, the other star then also collapses, forms a black hole, and that's the binary black hole that LIGO observed. Now, to form this thing, so in this scenario here, the two black holes at the end have been together for all their lives as binary stars. So they, they were born together, and then they eventually died together, if, if that makes sense. To make this work, though, you need to do some funny thing with the, with the stellar evolution, things like common envelope phase, so meaning a phase in which um, as the one of the two stars expands into supergiant, uh, which is something that our sun will do or so, 
it will the envelope of the supergiant needs to be so big to engulf the other the other object, which at that point is already a black hole, um, so that you got two objects, black hole and the core of the star, orbiting together in a sort of common giant hydrogen envelope, um, which drives energy dissipation, uh, which eventually will bring the separation down to the ten solar radii, the, the critical value. On the right, uh, you can do a completely different setup where you have you got two stars. They don't know anything about each other. They never met before. Separately, they collapse and form black holes. Black holes. They live in a dense environment. Things like globular clusters. So these are blobs of about 10 to the 5 stars that are present in the outermost galaxies. Um, in their core, their density of objects, in this case black holes, can be so high that black holes undergo many, many dynamical encounters. So they meet, then the binary disrupts, and then eventually they meet again or so. And statistically, this will um, aid, they will drive the formation of tight binaries. So these two guys eventually will meet, uh, meet a change or so, producing a binary that is tight enough to be uh, measured by, uh, by LIGO, to merge in, you know, in an able time actually measured by LIGO. All right, so how do we pick the right one? And here I'm moving slowly into the uh, some blue bear based on my you know this is my really my own research. Um, so how do we um, how do we pick the right one? So we have the gravitational wave data. How do we actually select what's at play in in the universe? And the framework that we use is Bayesian analysis. So um, hope many of you are are familiar with this. But the probability here in the top left, the probability of, get, of measuring some parameters giving some data B is the likelihood PD of data, so the probability of measuring the data, times a, a prior or so, so our previous knowledge of, of, uh, of the universe, in this case, you know, how stars behave or, or so. Now, these thetas here are the parameters that describe the single events, so say the masses of the black hole, their spins, their redshift, so how far, the eccentricity of the body, then eventually, what you want to do is combine many events. So LIGO so far has seen about 20 or 50 events. Um, you want to combine many events to infer things about stars and common envelope and clusters and supernova. The tool here is to, again, use bias theorem. We have some hyperparameters, beta, in, in this slide that depend on the enter the prior here. So now my prior is the probability of getting some parameter theta given my knowledge of the universe, beta. And then you again use bias theorem down here in what so-called Bayesian hierarchical framework to combine many measurements and make inference on the parameters beta, if that makes um, any sense. Um, right? So, and, and here is how, you know, a pi, you know, active in, in or or, or try and do this inference in, in practice. So the complication here, sorry if I go back, is that the population that you want to infer, it's, it's not known analytically in the sense that, you know, astrophysicists, they put lots of effort into simulating stellar evolution. Um, so there are these very complicated codes that, you know, you inject some knowledge of how the universe and, you know, this stellar physics is supposed to work and they produce um, you know, simulated, you know, synthetic list of LIGO events, that, that's what the detector could see. And now the, the task is, can we select the right one, uh, or better, can we measure these hyperparameters uh, within some accuracy? So the complication here is that you need to interpolate these arbitrarily complicated um, stellar physics simulation. So the ingredients that you need are well, you need a code to produce, you need the stellar evolution code to produce this, this population. Then you need the simulation. So you need to design, what you, these simulations are very costly. Take um, a pair of days on, on about a hundred cores or, or so. So it's a costly, it's a costly business. Um, so you need the simulation design. So you want to place these simulations optimally in, the, in your parameter space, the hyperparameter space. And in this case, we've been pioneering in the, in the field, at least, the use of Latin hypercubes. These are space filling techniques which are analogous to the, the popular puzzle Sudoku. 
the way in which the initial setup is constructed, so how many you know, numbers you have and how many are missing, is by an hypercube uh, idea where you fill the space as much as you can within in some metric with the um, right? Then in any case, this body of data, it's surely gonna be too big to any meaningful um, you know, treatment. So you need some form of data compression we can use in principal component analysis. And next, you need to interpolate the um, these simulations across the parameter and hyperparameter space at the same time. And so this is an example that I have in the figures in this slide, you got also segmented, which is a form of machine learning. Now I'm about to switch to neural networks, um, although the neural network pipeline is not fully working yet. Um, so here is an example. So given this training set of, of simulations here, how well we can predict the gravitational wave signal. And as you see, there's a large you know, uncertainty here, um, which is just because we don't have new simulation. So you put new ones, which are the empty dots here, and of course the errors are, are going down. So it's a prototype, but it works in a sense that you can efficiently interpolate um, across the multidimensional parameter space that we deal with. Um, then you plug everything into a, into a sampler, say a Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, the likelihood needs to be treated with care uh, because we have heavy selection effects. So you need to find how the detector responds to the given signal. Very likely to be detected. For instance, it's much easier to detect um, big masses compared to small masses. But also, it's much easier to detect things that are close by. So the distance matters and a lot here, right? If the binary is too far, then the gravitational wave signal will be too weak and I don't see it. So factoring in selection effects properly, and this was actually a big step that was in this, in, in this paper to understand how to actually do it in, in, in practice. Uh, it's a key piece uh, of the puzzle. Then you, you know, run your machinery, and these are some uh, you know, proof of principle results that, that we put out years ago now. Uh, yellow, uh, green, and, and, and red, which are obtained varying the metallicity of the environment. So how many metals, and by metals, so a metal for an astrophysicist, it's something, is anything that is not hydrogen or helium. So we call everything else metal. Metallicity of the, of the environment, how the spectrum of the masses of the black holes that LIGO should observe varies. And this dotted line, this black line here, are the results of our interpolation. That um, I mean, the point here is that we can capture even the the you know, sharp features or or so in the in the training data set. So, so really, the, the machine learning interpolation that is going on behind the scene uh, it seems to be working to be working well here. This is the similar um, you know prototype on a more complicated problem. Here are 125 stellar physics simulation. Again, each of them. Um, spanning multiple days on hundreds of, of, of um, HPC cores, um, varying over three parameters. So, sigma k is how strong supernova are in some sense, and alpha ce is how uh, important that common envelope phase that I mentioned before is. So, this giant hydrogen envelope um, engulfing the, 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 the core of both stars. And uh, these are results of our um, inference here, with and without some marginalization or, or so. Then again, we can, within possibly by limited sample, uh, capture um, the, broad, the broad feature and actually re reconstruct the, the true parameters of, of the problem. Um, and let me say that this pipeline was entirely uh, developed and prototyped on our Blue Bear and Athena, which is the tier two clustering uh, researchers have, have access. And well, work in, in, in preparation with, with, with my PhD students on, um, on the topic, which is uh, new LIGO data are coming out, which is really, um, you know, I think where the field is really going, this 
uh, uh, highly scalable population studies. Um, one more Blue Bear application here. This is a paper that I just published literally last two weeks ago or something like this. Um, selection effects. So as I was saying, is a crucial, absolutely crucial piece of, of the puzzle. In other terms, we need to know what we are missing. To do inference on what's around there in the universe, you need to know how your detector is behaved and what is detecting or, or missing. And so you can factor, in, can factor that in into the analysis and, and eventually reconstruct the, the, the true population. The problem is that developing, so doing uh, selection effects for gravitational wave detector, again, is a costly operation, estimating what you miss and what you don't miss. And the reason is that you have to try. So you have to inject a fake signal into the same pipeline that is used for detection and make sure and see if your pipeline you know, detects it or not. Um, this was done, but only using single, a single detector, while we really know that you know, we, we have three detectors operational now and two more are coming online. Um, so it's really a, a multi-detector problem, but for computational reason, you will tackled using a single detector, and that's still the state of the art, I mean, before, before our paper, um, and also neglecting some key features in the, in, in the gravitational wave signal, namely the presence of spins onto the two black holes. And again, this is just for computation because interpolating spinning parameter space is much, much easier. Uh, in analytic and standard techniques, we developed the very first uh, AI model, which is based on a neural network classifier, which was developed, so both the training set and the and the training process itself was actually done on, on, on Blue Bear. And we go beyond single detector and, and, and non-spinning approximation, fully considering the network uh, response. And what that I hear is the typical machine learning plot that I'm sure many of you have, have seen before. As a function of the training, training epoch of my, of my neural network, the growing accuracy with which the network can reproduce whether an event will be observed or not observed for increasing complexity. So actually, the, um, yes. All right, and I think this is all I wanted to say. Oh no, right, I have, I have another slide on this. So this work on the neural network classifier showed that current inference is actually biased. So in this plot here, I have the total mass of the black hole and the mass ratio, and the color of the scatter plot shows the difference between the usual, so the single detector approximation, which is supposed to mimic the true response. See, these issues, which was never uncovered before. And of course, right now we are safe in the sense that LIGO hasn't seen an event there yet, but if future events are there, um, this can be this can quickly become uh, become a problem, and this neural network model that we have actually tackles and, in my opinion, essentially solves uh, this issue. All right, so this is everything I have. Um, let me conclude with this picture here. So let me go back to the light um, light and gravity um, thing that I was showing in the beginning. So if you look at this picture, and I ask you what what is this? Well, it's an orchestra. Okay, they're playing. What are they playing? You don't know, right? I mean, we are, I'm putting you an image in front of you, not the sound, so you really don't know. Although the main thing that they are doing, namely playing, it's obscure to us, and we don't know. So it's the same thing with, with the universe and gravity and light or so. The universe is kept together by gravity, but the very same thing that keeps the universe together has so far been invisible or unknown to us. Um, with gravitational waves, the, what we're really doing is an attempt to listen instead of just um, observing um, the universe. And this is all I wanted to, to say. Maybe I should stop sharing. Thank you very much, Dr. David. And uh, that's quite very interesting presentation. And for some of us who are new to astronomy or theoretical physics and, 
and statistics, it's a little bit very clear. At least we're able to see the astrophysical world from uh, another perspective and such an interesting research and the way you have presented it, so wonderful. So we welcome questions well, from the participants and uh, please kindly type your questions into the chat room or you can raise your hand and uh, keep the conversation going. Questions? Okay. We don't have uh, questions yet, but uh, I still have my own question. Okay. Um, uh, every I have my own question, and it may not be uh, that technical from the the way you have presented it. Uh, but, uh, the, the, the question has more to do with the phenomenological approach that you have actually brought into into this research and i i the way you present some of these uh, uh celestial realities you know is as if they are conscious so i would just like to just curious to 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 know whether they are conscious entities too and um, some of these activities that have been monitored uh, are actually um something that are you know automated or something built into into the nature themselves like the laws and uh, sorry you're 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 breaking up so you're asking if okay i'm asking can you repeat <laughs> the question i'm asking is more or less not from a, pro a professional uh, side but i'm just asking to know that some of these uh, uh, realities that you are coming up with all this astrophysical world just to confirm whether they are conscious entities and some of the activities that are being monitored are something or, or already registered into nature, like determined, or something that's actually uh, part of the activities in the physical world have the impact on them. Um, I'm not sure. So the, the maybe I should ask, maybe I should uh, Maybe I should take a step back to explain the word in mathematics. I don't know how to answer to your question, but what I can put forward is my own wonder that this is possible. So that, you know, a you wrote down some super complicated equation, and then a hundred years later, this exact Hello, can you hear me? Okay, we can. We, we... Sorry, my Zoom crashed and then reopened. Oh, um, so I was saying that, you know, it, it's my wonder that, that, you know, the, the our mathematical representation of reality finds an exact replica in the experiments that we make. I think there's no reason that, that it's the case, but it is. I hope, I know, I'm not sure if it answered, but, um, I mean, that's part of the reason why I do the job I do. Right? Thanks very much. Uh, we have a comment from, uh, or some comments from the participants from David Christie. He says, fascinating, insufficient knowledge to ask questions, but thank you for presenting such complex ideas with such clarity. And David Marx asked, uh, what do you think will be the next big breakthrough? Um, going into space. So right now, the uh, experiments that we have are on the ground. So it's 40 kilometers, it's 40, it's four kilometers uh, on the ground. And that almost as much as we can do on the ground, there are plans to do it, to do them bigger, but it's, I mean, qualitatively, it, it's, it's what it is. Uh, the next big thing is going into space. So if you imagine moving this giant, you know, interferometers arm into orbit, um, that's gonna buy you million kilometers of, of interferometers are, which means you are sensitive to frequencies that are much, much lower in, in the gravitational wave spectrum, which means black holes, which are much, much bigger. We're talking about black holes of a million times the mass of our sun compared to 10 or, or so. This experiment exists, I mean, exists. It's planned, 
uh, it's called LISA, Laser Interferometer Space Based Space Antenna, and it's well right now fully approved by the European Space Agency in partnership with uh, with NASA. Date of launch right now is 2030, and we'll get there. Um, I mean, there's a lot of work to do, or or so, but we'll get there. And this is going to be the a breakthrough. So the, really qualitatively, much like you know observing. Um, optical wave instead of radio waves or so. It's a completely different part of the of the gravitation wave spectrum, um, which is gonna bring completely different sources and completely different things about the about the astrophysics. Lovely. And though some Celts made a comment that this presentation is so interesting. And though John A has a, a question. So you mentioned that the observation of the merger of the binary black hole system was the first event to be observed by multiple methods, light and gravity. So what other events do you think might be observed in the same way in the near future? Um, right, so sorry if I, maybe I misspoke or so. The event that was observed in both light and gravity was the merger of two neutron stars. Um, sorry if I, if I messed up. Um, I think the, well, hopefully the next big thing, the next multi, the kind of multi-messenger, uh, well, we, we're gonna observe more, but we're all waiting for a supernova to go on. Now a supernova event would be truly spectacular because that's the, the very end point of the life of a star where the black, where black holes actually is forming. Now the problem is that they need to be very, very close. I mean, these events here, gravitational wave events are in other galaxies. Um, you know, hundreds of megaparsecs away. We are really sensitive to supernovas only if they are in our own galaxy. And we know that the rate is about 1% of these kind of events. Um, and we need to be lucky. So it needs to be on this side of the galaxy because if it's on the other side, we won't see it in light. Uh, it's a long shot, um, but the, the scientific payoff would be enormous, absolutely enormous. Lovely, interesting. And, uh, so the thing that we don't want is to switch off the detector. I mean, and indeed, this is a funny fact. And there's an old detector of about 600 meters in Germany that doesn't really work to do any astrophysics. But when the LIGOs are off for, for uh, commissioning, so they have to do something in the detector or so, they turn the old Germany machine on just in case a supernova goes off right at that time. And we would otherwise miss it and then they need the center to, to pick a new one. Well, thank you so much. And uh, David much also complimented the, your presentation. I would like to ask, um, you, you know, based on the analysis that you have done, within the field, is there a consensus on this or is just uh, there are some people who have the opposing uh, perspective or dimension to, to some of these uh, findings? Um, so I think, well, there are the usual out outsiders, right? But I think, the fact that we've been observing gravitational waves and so it's pretty solid. I mean, really, yeah, the scientific community is adamant on this. That, I mean, they've done so many checks and, and so it, it, it seems unreal if I say like precision 10 to the minus 21 or so. Um, but there's absolute consensus that what we are seeing is real in the sense that it comes from, from the sky, it comes from the merger of black holes or so. The astrophysical interpretation on the other hand is very debated. So whether they come from, well, something I was hinting at, right? So, or like cluster, and you know, what kind of stars you need to form these black holes? What kind of clusters you need? And can a cluster explain this particular event or cannot explain this particular event? What are the mechanisms, you know, in the astrophysics you need to put together or so? Um, there are, you know, tens of papers per week on this. I would say. Um, so it's, it's very much debated, um, but the observations are there. And actually, after years in which we've been doing, uh, you know, predictions saying, oh, one day LIGO will observe something and then we'll be able to test our models. Now we are in a data-driven regime. So now we cannot, uh, my astrophysical models, uh, they, they, and, and verified. And if my model doesn't reproduce those data, then well, I have to do something else. It's actually, we are entering a, a data-driven uh, field uh, now, 
been within, has been very theoretical up to a few years ago. Thank you very much. And uh, we don't have any question again from the uh, audience and you have done excellently. So once again, on behalf of the team and the planning committee and the entire BL, uh, we appreciate your uh, coming to this event and also this intensive and, and uh, very interesting presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to get your presentation and have a follow up. So, at this uh, point, yes, do you need to use slides or something? Yes, so that the slides are, and then they will, okay. they, they will communicate with you for the for publication or other medium of um, exchange for the general audience. Okay, let me know, just send me an email. I, say, I can send you slides and, and everything that you need. Okay.